NMR spectroscopy has become one of the most frequently used analytical tools to elucidate chemical structure. It is particularly useful for carbon-based chemical compounds, also known as organic compounds, the molecules that make up all living things, and many substances that we interact with on a daily basis. In this video, we'll take a look at how NMR spectroscopy works and provide a visual metaphor for what is happening at the nuclear level. If we consider a chemical compound, we are particularly interested in what atoms are present and what the arrangement of those atoms are. If we were able to look inside an atom, we'd see a dense and positively charged nucleus. It is the nucleus that NMR spectroscopy detects and gives us a lot of information about the overall structure of the molecule. Here's how it works. Ordinarily, nuclei are oriented randomly, but if we place a sample of a chemical compound in a strong magnetic field at the heart of the NMR instrument, the nuclei line up like a compass needle aligning in a magnetic field and start to process like a spinning top as it spins on a table. By convention, the magnetic field, designated B0, is oriented along the z-axis. Different nuclei have different spins, and the ones with spin one-half can exist in one of two possible spin states. These include the following atomic isotopes. The hydrogen nucleus, usually referred to as simply the proton, is present in almost all organic compounds and is the one most frequently analyzed by NMR. The precession frequency, or Larmor frequency, is given by the following equation and is dependent on the strength of the magnetic field and the gyromagnetic ratio, which is a constant for a given isotope. If we apply now a short radio frequency pulse, or RF pulse, at right angles to B0, the nuclei will flip down to the XY plane in unison and continue to process. Let's represent the average magnetic moment of a set of nuclei by this sphere. At equilibrium, the magnetization vector will be aligned along B0 as depicted here. As we've seen, the RF pulse will flip the magnetization vector to the XY plane. The rotating magnetization vector induces a current in a receiver coil. This signal is detected and amplified. We can see that the oscillating signal sweeps out a sine wave with decreasing magnitude as the nucleus realigns with the magnetic field B0. This wave is called the free induction decay, or FID. If each proton sweeps down an FID at the same frequency, then each proton would look identical, and we wouldn't be able to learn anything about the overall structure of the molecule. But here's the key. Each proton is in a unique chemical environment. Let's consider two protons in different parts of the molecule. Each will be exposed to a different magnetic field depending on the electron density distribution. The electron creates its own magnetic field, which opposes the applied magnetic field, B0. A proton with a high electron density around it experiences a lower magnetic field and therefore a lower Larmor frequency, and a proton in an electron-poor environment has a higher frequency. Typically, protons in an electron-rich environment are referred to as shield Shielded, and those in electron-poor environment are referred to as deshielded. Aromatic rings, such as benzene, can induce their own magnetic fields, which can further modify the magnetic field around the proton. Now, if we pulse these with an RF pulse, we will get two signals in our FID, one oscillating at a high frequency and one oscillating at a low frequency. The FID is a representation of the wave in the time domain. The Fourier transformation mathematically converts this to the frequency domain, which allows for a visual representation in an NMR spectrum. With the shielded protons giving peaks at the right side and the deshielded protons giving peaks on the left side. Let's look at an example. Here's a simple molecule with hydrogens in five different electronic environments. Each type of proton will experience a slightly different magnetic field strength and will process at its own frequency, giving five overlapping signals in the FID. After Fourier transformation, we will get a spectrum with five peaks, each peak representing a proton or set of protons in a particular chemical environment. With this spectrum in hand, we can start to deduce the chemical space around each proton. 
We have seen that an isolated proton or group of identical protons will give an NMR spectrum with a single peak, known as a singlet. Sometimes we will have protons that are close enough that their magnetic spin states interact, what's known as spin-spin coupling. In this case, the peaks do not appear as a singlet, but rather appear as a split peak, known as a doublet. For example, if proton A has a neighbor, proton B, in a different electronic environment, proton A will be affected by its neighbor. Proton B will either be aligned up or down, thus proton A will be a doublet. Likewise, proton B will be split by proton A, and it will be a doublet also. Two neighboring protons will give a triplet, and three neighboring protons will give a quartet. You can even see quintets and septets in some cases. Spin-spin coupling can give us valuable information about the connectivity of the atoms in a molecule because it shows us which protons are close to which other protons. I hope this video has provided some useful images to provide a visual metaphor of how NMR spectroscopy works. As a next step, you may want to focus on the equations that are used to describe the behavior of nuclei in a magnetic field. You may also want to get a deeper understanding of how the NMR spectrum is used to interpret chemical structure, and a lot of that skill will come with practical experience in seeing firsthand the relationship between structures and their resulting spectra. Well, thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you later.